You're beautiful, talented, and famous. You're an actress who's the envy of everyone who knows you. And then they don't know me. If you love listening to this show, please consider giving a rating and a review on Amazon Alexa or wherever you listen. We want to continue bringing you this amazing content, and part of our ability to do that means that we need a big audience. Now, it may not seem like much, but rating and reviewing the show will help more people find us, just like how you found this show. Simply on any podcast platform, search for a show, scroll down to the bottom, and push five stars. It's that easy. Thanks for supporting the show. So today I'm joined by retired Colonel Liam Collins, who spent his career as a special forces officer, and he was a founding director of the Modern War Institute at West Point and served as a director of the Combating Terrorism Center. So I want to welcome Colonel Liam. Thanks for joining today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Well, let's start with a fun fact. Uh, you have a multi-million dollar winning racehorse named after you. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more? Yeah, I'll try to keep it short, but uh, basically I was trying to thank one of our uh, big donors, our institute at West Point, and uh, what do you do to thank somebody that, you know, is, uh, can buy what he wants. So I gave him a map that I jumped into Afghanistan. So when I, uh, in 2001, jumped into Afghanistan from, or parachuted in from 18,000 feet. So I had this, these maps that we made. So I gave him the map as a gift, and then he calls me a few months later and says, hey, I, I, named the, I, I bought a horse for $600,000. I named it Liam's Map. And all I could think of is like, Every time they end up being a loser, right? And, and I think, right, this is like the, the three-legged dog, right, or something. But uh, the person's involved in three helicopter crashes. But sure enough, the horse was a winner and, and, and made a lot of money. And it's still, it's, it's making a lot of money in retirement now. So, but that's kind of how it went. But it was kind of crazy. Well, I hope that there's some royalty that you're getting back. Uh, absolutely not. But I wish there was. <laughs> Perfect. So look at your bio. Uh, you're definitely somewhat of a renaissance man in terms of navigating the world of research, uh, special forces, foreign relations, even nonprofit, in addition to being a coach and an athlete. What motivates and excites you? Yeah, for me, it's I just, uh, you know, like like the challenge, I guess, or the competition, you know, either comp competing or, or challenge, whether that's, you know, uh, you know, running a marathon or, you know, trying to do a dissertation while you're doing a full-time job, but really just kind of striving to succeed in whatever it is that you're doing. Well, clearly you're, you're very exceptional and uh, strive for excellence in everything that you do. So let's get into uh, some of the research that you've done, kind of going back several, you know, several decades, perhaps. Um, in terms of your dissertation work at Princeton, uh, it was focused on innovation. Um, and can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, so I was really trying to understand innovation from an organizational perspective, right? Why do some organizations, and specifically the military, why at times does it innovate well, and why does it, you know, do it so poorly? And, coming from a special operations background, including our most elite units, we had a very innovative culture. And, and the military often gets beat for not being very innovative. And I mean, you can look at examples throughout history, keeping, you know, horse cavalry for decades past its kind of usefulness. Um, and, and so really kind of a, taking an interest there, understanding why don't we do a better job at it and, and, and how can we learn from that and do a better job in the future. And really the, the thing that I was kind of surprised to find out is, is the Important role that the leader plays in that. The senior leader really plays a critical role in that whole innovation process and whether it succeeds or fails. Yeah, that's uh, really intriguing. Actually, there's a, a recent uh, research that was done around the role of CEOs, in particular around corporate innovation, and I actually wrote an abstract on Forbes uh, related to that. So, so, let's, so let's talk a little bit about that. What are some leadership traits or influence tactics that that you've seen from research and experience that has really lifted innovation the most? Right, so first of all, I think mean, across, you know, whether it's the military or, or, or business or wherever, right? I mean, we, they, they need planning, social, communication, persuasive skills, but two of the most critical really is technical expertise and creative problem solving skills. So 
it, this explains, right, you've got to have technical expertise in the field that you're leading. You can't just take, you know, a so-called innovative leader from one field and stick them in a field that they're unfamiliar with. They, they won't succeed, right? You can't just be an innovator, right, across the board. Why? Because during kind of the formulation phase as you're developing the innovation, that leader plays a critical role in where you invest for project selection, provide stimulation to that innovative team. Uh, and if they don't have technical expertise in that field, really all they can do is really resource them and stick them in a corner in the basement and tell them to innovate. But it doesn't work without the leader really having that interaction with them. And then later during the formulation or during the implement implementation phase, overcoming internal resistance to innovation that you're going to have no matter what organization. Yeah, those are some really uh, uh, very heavy subjects. Um, and, I, and I'm sure some of those philosophies have changed over the years. You know, for example, the executives that used to be groomed out of General Electric, for instance, for instance, would be in a position where if they didn't make it to the CEO or chairmanship, they would often leave and lead another company of completely different sector. Uh, but I think to your point is that there's a need for not just deep experience, senior experience, but to have that domain expertise and technical expertise. That's terrific. Um, I want to have a, a little bit of conversation around what does military innovation look like now? Uh, what, what are you seeing in terms of that landscape and how is it changing? Right. I think too often when we focus on innovation in the military, we, we think of technological innovation and, and technology in and of itself isn't, it, it, it's an innovation when you look at it by itself, but for the military, that's an invention, not an innovation. Think of like the tank, right? In World War I when it was invented, right? It was an invention. Armored warfare is the innovation for the military, Right where you could actually figure out how to employ this in a fundamentally different way than it was before and kind of let's create warfare with, that the Germans developed for World War II. And so it's too often we get focused on technology, but really that's just a component of it. And it's kind of doctrinal innovation and those kind of things is where we're going. And so I think, you know, the military, there is a lot of you know, institutional resistance to change oftentimes, like I gave the example of cavalry, um, but it's, you know, it's not often out of malice or something. It, it's, it's kind of a cognitive dissonance. If you've been told your whole career for 20 years or 15 years or 10 years, you've been groomed to be, hey, this is how we ride armored cavalry. Uh, then all of a sudden to say that it's no longer useful, it kind of says what you've done for 15 years is no longer useful. And so that's one of the reasons change is so hard. Um, but, but they're, they're making some, you know, some changes now. And I'd say the doctrinal ones are, are some of the most important or thinking about how to fight differently are the most important. Yeah. So as we think about modern warfare, I mean, the, the context of uh, today's war um, is very different from, let's say, even you know, 50 years ago. So in that context, what matters and what is going to give the military that, that additional advantage vis-a-vis -vis their competitors? Yeah, I mean, I think we're still overly invested, right, in a, in a lethal kind of ground force, right? We, we, we need to, without a doubt, be able to use that to deter and defeat if required. But we're over-invested in that one capability, under-invested in others that potential adversaries or competitors are, are investing more heavily in, such as Chinese or Russian, right? Uh, and kind of the operating in the gray zone or below the threshold of where, war, right? And, and taking advantage of, of uh, where there's not international agreements kind of in the cyber domain or what constitutes a, an act of war or not. And so we're losing in those domains because we don't take a collective look at what it means to, for collective security for the, for the nation. And maybe the COVID crisis has kind of brought that out that we really aren't thinking um, broadly enough about what defense and security means. But I think typically we're, we're yes, without a doubt, we're kind of that kinetic, large lethal force. We're, we're capable of that, but I think we're over invested in that and it puts us, um, you know, at risk in other domains. Yeah, I think that's a terrific point. Uh, and, and certainly on the topic of uh, China is an example that has heavily invested into artificial intelligence, and particularly uh, that does put a, a put a bit of a challenge uh, for other other nations and and sovereignties. Uh, what are you seeing in terms of the U.S. military in terms of new ways of uh, gaining that advantage, whether it's through artificial intelligence, data analytics, cybersecurity? What's going to make the difference in, in today's context? I mean, I think all those are going to make a difference. And I think the military recognizes it and talks about it. But if you really see the actions where the money is being spent and following through with it, I'm not so sure that's happening. You know, we're still heavily invested in, in kind of unique 
you, you know, large, expensive, multi, multi hundred mil, million dollar air, air platforms that are extremely vulnerable, right? That, you know, maybe a swarm or something can take them down mm-hmm. um, versus kind of investing in unmanned platforms, cheaper, you know, easier to produce, uh, much less risky in terms of putting people in harm's way. And I think, um, you know, we're underinvested in those kind of things. And, and one of the reasons why is, I mean, the military industrial complex that Eisenhower warned us about decades ago is still alive and well. And I mean, it's the same reason we invest in those platforms, we're underinvested in other areas within defense is why we don't invest in our State Department and other things. There's just no constituency in it. Now, my understanding is that in the last uh, few decades, um, DOD in particular has, to, and, uh, and, uh, and its partners have developed a number of different strategies as well as uh, vehicles and organizations specifically to address uh, the spin-on technology, which is really looking to private sector and taking some of those uh, technologies and bringing those commercializations into the context and relevancy for defense. How is that working out? Yeah, I mean, obviously, I mean, with the Project Maven, there was, you know, attempts there that ultimately failed, um, you know, DIUX, as it's called the acronym, but kind of looking at defense industry, right? How can we have this partnership with the, with the uh, um, private sector? And, you, and if, when you think, you know, back in, you know, go back decades, you know, all, many scientific advances were developed by the military and NASA. Right, and, and now that's no longer the case. It, it's being developed by business, and we're adopting those. Um, but the challenge we still face is, even though we have those those partnerships there, our acquisition process is still slow and antiquated. We haven't updated that since uh, the McNamara era decades ago. And so, if you don't fix the acquisition process, and you're still in a two-year kind of multi-year what we call a programming you know, the PPDS cycle, right? It's not going to be that way. We, I don't think you can buy a, you know, field the entire army with a, with the newest, let's say, unarmed aerial vehicle, right? Instead of doing that, just do one division at a time, buying the latest, it changes, and then field the next one a year later. So, you know, logistically, it's a little more painful, but it'll allow the army to kind of stay current as opposed to kind of trying a model where everybody has the same thing. That almost guarantees everybody will have outdated technology, unless you guess right when the war will happen, and you happen to field everything as the war happens. but we will never guess right. Yeah, that's a, that's a really uh, valid point. I agree with that, uh, that incremental approach to adoption. Now, again, I, I was under the impression that there were some procurement um, um, facilities that allow for a more accelerated path. Um, so you, you, do you feel that those are not working as effectively as it could, you know, especially in relative to working with the private sector? Yeah, I mean, I think those are, those are working somewhat well. I mean, the special operations um, forces kind of have, you know, that's kind of part of their charter, right? That's, that's one of the things you're supposed to experiment with this technology, figure out what works. And then, right. You don't want to make a major investment for the large army uh, for something that's not going to work. Uh, and so that works to some extent, but again, I think there's too much of that thought of, for example, what technology do we need as mm. opposed to, right. If the Russians have a, a extremely good electronic warfare capability, I've gone and talked to our commanders at our, you know, combat training centers and ask them, well, why do you put up these antenna farms at the Russian, you know, or somebody with similar technology, right? Because the, um, you know, the democratization of technology kind of is faster and faster every year. So the Russians have it, you know, a, a lower capable uh, potential adversary will have it. Um, you know, and it, it, you basically kind of like emanating with your electronic signature, like here we are. Um, well, why don't you, you know, effectively punish them for it and, and, and knock them out with artillery? And, and the answer is, well, then they'll, you know, be dead for 24 hours and won't get any training. And I said, well, that's how they're get the training, right? If you don't punish them accordingly for making mistakes. Mm. But, so the story is kind of, we, we're too focused right on the technology, not looking at doctrinal changes or, or tactical changes, you know, that we could easily, you know, costless implement, but it's harder to operate that way. Uh, and, and, and so we, we kind of don't do that. And so that's why I'm more pessimistic. So can you talk a little bit about kind of the cultural shift and uh, going back to the earlier uh, portion of the interview where you said that the leader plays such a critical role in the innovation. And when you talk about the military, it's not just one unified organization. It's many, many parts all with different various objectives, mandates and and directives. How um, do you feel that the doctrine and the tactics can be uh, cascaded down in such a way that over time you can start to see some significant shift in mindset and direction. 
Yeah, I mean, part of it, right, is it's sometimes easier to do in combat than in peacetime where you get a, a more rapid um, feedback on, right, how, how effective is this, right? Where we're kind of in a, you know, a, for the large part, kind of in a training environment in terms of some of these capabilities. But the Russians have been using their, the war in Ukraine and the Donbass where they're operating with the, with the, uh, uh, the separatists and, and really using it as a test ground to test all their new equipment and, and capabilities. Uh, so, so getting that feedback, but in terms of right counterinsurgency doctrine, for an example, right, uh, General Petraeus, you know, implemented it effectively in Afghanistan, developed it, and was the commander of the Combined Armed Center at Fort Leavenworth, really forced the army to adopt it, right, where, mm. you know, the answer was, hey, it's going to take us six months or 12 years, you know, to get it into our curriculum, and he said, no, we're shut down schools for three weeks, and, and we're going to start the curriculum in three weeks, right, and really forcing that change that most people would be kind of hesitant. We can't shut down for three weeks when in the war. He said, no, we're, we're shutting down because we're teaching them stuff that's not useful to them. Uh, and so making those hard choices an example, and then ultimately able to implement it over in Iraq. Um, but yeah, it's, it's one of those, it, it's, it's kind of a combination of on the development side and then forcing implementation. And then when you're forcing implementation, right, having the techniques in place, right, appointing those trusted, you know, just like in a, in a civilian company, right, or, or a politician, right? Why do you bring in your appointed officials? Because you trust them to kind of carry it, carry out your mandate and identify, right, the foot draggers or the hedgers or the, the saboteurs that are trying to sabotage uh, your efforts. Yeah, those are excellent points that you make. Uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, kind of forward-looking and uh, rather a kind of nascent, uh, you know, uh, division, which is a Space Force. And how that changes the battleground uh, as we look at, you know, not tanks and ships and planes, but now we're looking at satellites and kind of, you know, beyond um, terrestrial. Right. And it really space, our communications, our navigation, right, everything is tied with space. And, and as I was saying, we get more and more. Um, reliant on technology now, right? You think about when we grew up, right? We travel cross country with our parents. We could pull out a map book and read, you know, look at the, you know, Mad McNally Road Atlas. Well, right now, all they look at is a, you know, tiny what's on the on their GPS of their phone or their TV screen, right? They they don't even have that, you know, concept in their mind of what a map looks like, and so they get more and more dependent on that and satellite communications, all those things, right? Where we have to have you know, blue force tracker or something where we know where every single one of our soldiers is at all times, right? Or the, you know, the, the tanks and stuff. So all those are completely dependent on that. And so we get more and more reliant on those. So we have to ensure that, right, the sustainability of these things, either from kind of a kinetic attack or through, right, cyber or something else. So that's kind of the, why the importance of the, in the establishment of the Space Force, because whether it's ships or planes or tanks, right, everything's dependent on it. Yeah. Now, some of these uh, assets like uh, satellites are not always uh, owned and operated by the military. Uh, so when you think about, um, um, you know, Starlink, which is uh, the company that Elon Musk owns as it relates to satellites and their goal of providing satellite um, mesh, essentially uh, network all around the globe. What does that mean? And does the military play a role in terms of protecting private assets or do you guys work jointly? I'm just curious to see how that works. I mean, I think on that, though, I mean, part of it, too, is, right, we used to have, you know, better, right, effectively spy or whatever intelligence collection than others, but all this is getting more and more into the public domain, and, right? So it really just kind of levels that, that, that playing field where, um, you know, adversaries have this, you know, really almost the same capability as we have to some extent on, on some of those things. And so why are we better, right? It's because, right, our doctrine, our people, our leadership, right, our culture, that's why we can still defeat them. Um, yeah, large budget helps too. Right? Those other those human components are what matter more. Um, but yeah, I mean, in times of you know uh, conflict, yeah, I mean that's kind of what I was saying kind of before is kind of operating under the threshold of war is you know a multinational corporation or an American cor owned corporation. What's the role in protecting that? Whether it's from a cyber attack or something else, um, and so those those kind of are are kind of left unanswered to some extent. Uh, I We've had uh, several guests uh, on a sister podcast that focuses on uh, climate change and sustainability. And one angle that has uh, been brought up to um, heighten attention is, is the risk of climate change as it relates to uh, defense and our ability to protect our country. So as we think about, you know, let's say the Arctic zone where certain 
what used to be a much larger area of uh, ice mass is starting to melt and allow for easier tra transit, not just for uh, commercial transit, but for potential, you know, military purposes as well, that, you know, increases the risk of, you know, foes and, and enemies potentially coming through that, that path. How does climate change, from your perspective, affect uh, military decisions and, and expenditures and, and planning? I think, I mean, probably, be, I mean, the military really, I think, has a short-term time horizon, so I think it doesn't affect it that much, unfortunately, right? We should have a longer term towards it, but I think it's, again, if you look at, you know, understand organizations and you focus on it, how long is someone going to be in a given job, right? Two years max, probably, right? And, and so it's, it's they're, they're incentivized not to think in the long term. Uh, and so I don't think we put a lot of thought into that, um, but I think probably, I think, you know, the climate change in, in terms of, right, those direct threats, I think those exist, but I think those are probably less challenging than, than really the other domestic costs, right, with the weather patterns changing or, you know, civil unrest across the globe, right, Cur you know, combined with population growth and, and lack of water in places in Yemen, Somalia, right, things like that will then cause regional instability. I think that's probably more of a greater risk to our security than, you know, a direct attack or something from the, from the Ar Arctic opening up. Yep. Great point. I uh, agree with that. If this interview was being uh, uh, seen or heard by the key leadership throughout uh, the, the military um, organizations, what are one or two things that you will want to communicate to them right now? Yeah, I mean, I would say, I mean, first and foremost, like I said, I mean, we got to fix the acquisition uh, acquisition system and kind of get with the speed of technology, right? Not so, a system that's built in the 1950s, but understand that that technology is changing uh, how, how you can do that. And then, and then second of all, I mean, really think about how you invest in intellectual capital, right? In, invest in the right intellectual capital and resource, right, those people accordingly. Um, at, everywhere I've had success, it's right, it's been with, doing that, right? Bringing in really talented people, resourcing them, giving them time and the capability to just run and do their jobs. And so that's what I would say is, is where they need to focus. Super. So with that, I've been joined by retired Colonel Liam Collins. I want to thank you for joining today. All right. Thank you. If you've enjoyed this episode, take a moment to rate our show on any podcast platform that you listen to. Scroll down to the bottom and push five stars. It's that easy. And as always, thanks for listening. Oh,